We enter into this story after the baptism of Jesus, right at the calling of his first disciples. If you remember the scene, Jesus gets in line behind all these other believers so that John can baptize him. It's a beautiful picture because it tells us the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords waits in line with everybody else. <laughs> You know, when Paul says he humbled himself, even humbled himself to death on a cross, I think the better imagery in terms of being humble is the fact that he didn't cut in line and say, hey, son of God here, I need to be first. But instead, he just got in line with everybody else. And John recognized him. But this is later, and he, he walks past, and, and John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And without hesitation... We find out it's Andrew and some poor other guy who doesn't get a name, but it's one of the disciples. And they almost instantly start to follow Jesus. Now, is that one of these cases where these guys will follow anybody? It, it really doesn't matter who it is. If they've got a nice robe and a good speaking voice, that they'll follow them very easily. Scholars have suggested that a better way to understand it, and I agree with this, is that they were so devout and they so trusted John that they knew the next step was to follow Jesus. Because if John endorsed him, it must be true. They trusted the baptizer. But this constant unwritten question in the Bible that comes out here very clearly and literally is, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? We see Jesus, of course, standing in line and John asking Jesus in a way, what are you looking for? Shouldn't I be baptized by you? And Jesus says, no, it's going to be like this. It's also a reminder to us of what Christian community is supposed to look like. Because here's Jesus forming this, this first 12, this first group of, of apostles. And if you combine it with the other stories of who else he throws into this crazy group of people, you get to see very clearly that God is not afraid of conflict or different ideas. Not every disciple came out of the same small town or the same big town. Not every disciple came out of the same size family or the same socioeconomic background. And the crazy one in our day and age that kind of speaks to me is he had quite a dichotomy in two of his disciples. He had Matthew, who was a tax collector and a friend of the Roman establishment, and then maybe sitting right next to him some nights listening to Jesus teach was Simon the Zealot and Revolutionary. Friends, you think Democrats and Republicans have a wide berth in between them. You should see these two guys. Their ideologies were so crazy, distant from one another. It is amazing that Jesus could get them under the same roof or around the same fire. Two of the most different people, two of the most opposing political ideas, were both handpicked by Jesus. When Jesus asked Matthew and Simon what they were looking for, it was more than their preferences or their politics. Jesus didn't condemn the liberal or he didn't condemn the conservative, but he engaged them both and he taught them about God's kingdom and God's dream for humanity. You see, God's principles can include different viewpoints. And ours will basically form exclusions and divide if we don't hear from one another. And then there was Andrew and the other disciple, poor nameless guy, they're looking for something, so they're following John the Baptist. And as soon as John proclaims Jesus as the Lamb of God, they just start following Jesus. And Jesus turns around and he says, what are you doing? What are you looking for? And they didn't say, well, we're looking for uh, freedom for our people. Uh, we're, we're looking for, for freedom of the press or, or freedom of speech. Or we're looking for uh, uh, an extra vat of olive oil in every household. Or we're looking to build a, a nice temple for God that's in this district so it's easier to get to. They didn't have a list of preferences or demands. They, they, their response was crazy. It doesn't even make any sense. We might have to unpack it later. Jesus says, what are you looking for? And they said, where are you staying? 
It sounds like having a conversation with a toddler, doesn't it? What are you looking for? Where are you staying? Well, that doesn't sound like the answer to my question at all. That's the one I'm given. Try and figure it out. But for some reason, it was the right answer, wasn't it? Where are you staying? Jesus says, come and see. They answered correctly. And we have no clue what it means. You can unpack that baby in the Greek and it still doesn't make any sense. What are you looking for? Where are you staying? Come and see. Jesus said, come and see. What are you looking for? What do you seek? Who are you looking for? Andrew and the other disciples said, where are you staying? And they followed Jesus and they stayed at the same place. And then while they were there, Andrew left and looked for his brother Simon. And he says, we found the Messiah. Simon, son of John, is brought before Jesus and Jesus just renames him. Not, hey, how you doing? I understand you like to go fishing. I like to go fishing too. Hey, what do you think? Maybe sometime we go down by the, the lake and I'll do some teaching out of your boat. Would that be cool? That'd be great. You know what? And if you have a rough day, I, I know where the good fish are. Oh, that'd be great. Jesus, son of God, that'd be wonderful. No, he says, I don't like where this is going because you need a new name. I see a new name in you. You're going to be Peter. And we know elsewhere in scripture means rock. And on that rock, I will build my church, he says. And see, this authority of Jesus to answer things or do things in ways we don't understand is already there. We don't have to give authority to Jesus. Jesus already has it. But these stories of how he calls his followers are critical because it shows that his authority must be proclaimed by us to be believed by others. Jesus can stand at the door and knock and we can ignore it. And Jesus can stand and ignore Jesus can stand at the door and knock in the lives of those we love and care for. But if we don't introduce them to the living Christ, they are not going to know who's knocking, will they? John calls him the Lamb of God, meaning he's given authority beyond John. And Andrew and the other disciple leave John to follow Jesus, and they call him rabbi or teacher. And later he's going to be proclaimed as Messiah. It's like this progressive understanding of who Jesus is by each of the variety of folks that Jesus calls to be his disciple. First call was Andrew and the one other, just trusting in the proclamation of Jesus by John the Baptist. And then, of course, Jesus' invitation. Then Andrew shares with Peter for this second call. And then next, Jesus finds Philip and he says, follow me. And Philip calls Nathaniel and tells him they found the one Moses has been speaking about. What would have happened if Andrew and this other disciple just followed Jesus and thought how cool it was? That was it. No, no one went and told Simon, who would be called Peter. They just kind of kept it to themselves. Well, there would have been no, no movement. There would have been no one to write down what Jesus said. There would have been no one to feed the widow and the orphan as they came through these towns. There would have been no church. There would have been no movement. But when they were in the pure presence of Jesus Christ, they were willing to change everything in their life for him. But here's the funny part. Philip comes to Nathaniel and he says, hey, we've got all this worked out. It's amazing. And Nathaniel says, <laughs> I don't think so. He challenges him. And he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Have you seen their football team? My gosh, there's no way they have a Messiah. They can't even win a game. Apparently, Nazareth was the Cleveland of uh, the Holy Land, the ancient world. Only time as a Browns fan I'm ever going to get a perfect season. We went 0-16. But it means that people were only considered to have potential if they came from powerful families or great cities. A poor carpenter in Nazareth would not have been able to produce a great rabbi, let alone a Messiah. But that reminds us yet again that God's principles are not our principles. God's ways are not our ways naturally. We have to conform to God. 
if we attempt to wait for God to conform to us, we'll be waiting a very long time and we'll be very disappointed in the end. Nathan, Nathaniel, he was surprised to know that Jesus knew about him in the fig tree. Now this is also an understood symbolic thing in the scriptures that means Jesus knew where he lived. It wasn't that he was literally by a fig tree. He knew that that fig tree was close to a place and Jesus knew maybe the exact house he lived in. Jesus was kind of from this region anyway, and maybe it's also suggesting Jesus and Nathaniel grew up together. Maybe they went to opposing high schools, I don't know. But he knew who he was. But he also had this, so that's kind of like the practical neighbor kind of sense. But he also had the Son of God ability to look him in the eye and say, there's a good man. And Nathaniel's like, how do you know me? How is this even possible? Who are you? Where are you? What are you looking for? Where are you at? Jesus asks, what are you looking for? The disciples respond, where are you staying? Where do you abide? Oh, John, you sneaky evangelist. Now we're starting to see where this is going. Where do you abide? Same word. Where are you staying? Where do you abide? Because wherever Jesus abides is where the true disciple is to go, is to stay, is to be. What are you looking for? Well, peace, love, acceptance, justice, hope, goodness, kindness, comfort, you name it. But when faced with the same question by Jesus, his disciple said, where are you staying? We already know what we're looking for. But we believe we will find everything in you. So you tell us where you're going to be, and we will find what we're looking for. If you are who you say you are, we want to be where you're at. If you are who you say you are, Lord, we want to be where you're at. The disciple must dwell. The disciple must stay. The disciple must abide. That should sound really familiar to you if you've studied or read through the book of John. Because fast forward to chapter 15, verse 5. And Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Anyone who abides in me, anyone who stays with me, anyone abiding in me as I abide in him bears much fruit apart from me can do nothing. The term for dwell, the term for abide in 15.5 is the same as, O Lord, where are you staying? O Lord, where do you abide? O Lord, where are you at? And Jesus said, come and see. Come and see. Instead of what can you do for me, Lord? God, where are you at? Where can I find you? He said, come and see. Because you can believe in Jesus. You can know who Jesus is. And that's powerful. And that's that's important. But we are clearly taught by Christ himself that to be his disciple, we must not only believe in him, but we must also dwell with him. We must abide with him. We must abide in Christ and stay in Christ. Not visit him on Sunday mornings. Not maybe once a week for Bible study. Abide. Remain. Stay connected. To Christ. So Christ asks us all this morning, what are you looking for? Might we be bold enough to respond? Where are you staying? O oh Lord, where do you abide that I might abide with you? Because we already know his response, don't we? <laughs> Come and see. Come and see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.